Norto, look for her daughter's name for me, because if our daughter comes, I don't want to talk about it, you know? Her daughter says she's going to try to join this evening. Mm -hmm. Her daughter's name is Savannah. You remember mm -hmm. the little girl that would participate in that single followers class? Savannah, with all the questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, yeah, Safana. That was her name, Safana. Let me start this up. And I'm going to record this because this needs to be heard. Yeah. In Alhamdulillah, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Before we begin our lecture today, um, I would like to just take a moment uh, to share some bad news that we've been dealing with here in the Zoom room uh, for the past uh, few days. We didn't know if the news was true or not because there's so many scams out there, but alhamdulillah, we found out today, in fact, just an hour ago, that the word is true. Uh, one of our beloved sisters, she was new. Uh, she's been coming to this website for the past year since I had my surgery. Her name was Rashida. Uh, she would always join our Zoom room. Uh, she was from Imam Kareem Abu Zaid's community. And I was so honored to have her here because I have so much respect for uh, Imam Kareem and his community. And uh, when she first came here, she said, Sister Layla, I've heard a lot about you. Uh, she said, Imam Kareem uh, speaks of you, uh, highly of you. And she said, I listened to a few of your lectures on YouTube, she said, and you inspired me so much. She said, so I just wanted to join the Zoom and mashallah, she said, uh, when you were giving your lectures, it's like you were speaking to me. She said, you picked me up uh, at a bad time in my life because she had just you know, learned of me. And at that point, you guys remember, it was the time when I was going through my personal situation. I had just had my total knee replacement surgery. And you guys know I was in a bad place because of the pain and I was alone. I had no one to help me. I couldn't walk, I was crippled. So, and she's also was a counselor. She had her master's degree in, in uh, social work. And it's like a law sent her. She would say that a law sent me to her at a crucial time in her life. But I looked at it like a law sent her as at a crucial time in my life because I had just, uh, got the Zoom room opened and I was dealing with my anxiety and my pain and uh, her along with Amina and all the rest of y'all that's here, all, nor to all the regulars is in the Zoom. She was, became one of us and was, you know, telling me how to deal with my anxiety. And I remember her telling me to, she was, her and Pfizer uh, were the ones that told me to listen to the waterfalls and listen to, you know, the fireplace. Cause back then I lived in a different place and I had the fireplace. In fact, uh, I ended up moving here where I am and I bought me a waterfall because she, uh, Rashida said that that's in her therapy that she does with some of her clients uh, who suffer with anxiety, it helped to calm them. And we became very close. She was coming here every day for the classes. She was in the, on the West Coast in Colorado with Imam Kareem, and, but she was coming here in between her working because she had three 
beautiful daughters. Uh, her daughter, uh, Safana, uh, became one of our students here at the Suna Followers Kids. And she had another little daughter too, a four-year-old, beautiful little girl. And then she had an older daughter. Her older daughter had some uh, uh, developmental issues, but she was beautiful. I thought, thought she was just gorgeous. So we helped each other and she became a regular. She'd come in here and at nighttime and hang out with me and Amina Fresno, Anissa, Norto, Aisha, Precious, all the West Coasters, Antar, Sabrine, because the West Coasters, you know, they stay up later because they're in a different time zone. So we all became close. And uh, if you guys listen to the um, uh, Hadith class, when I started teaching the 200 Hadiths for Muslim women, she always made it to those classes. And she would, uh, you'd hear me say on the recordings, uh, uh, Sister Rashida, would you like to share perhaps you you have some experience in this. And she'd get on the mic. Yes, as a social worker, I've experienced this and that. She was so good. And I would always have her close us out. I would say, okay, well, I'm going to have Sister Rashida close us out because she uh, was a, a licensed social worker and dealt with some of those issues. And so we got closer. And then uh, about a, January last month, you know, she had went away for about two months. We didn't hear from her. So she popped up in here last month, and I mean, I mean, I Fresno asked the girl, "Where you been?" She said, "I'm Ubering." So we were like, "You're Ubering?" She's like, "Yeah, I'm Uber driving now." She said, "Because I'm trying to get money together." She said, "So I can go and visit my husband." She had met some man and married him off her, you know, social media, and he lived in Gambia, in Gambia. And so uh, she was going over there, you know, she said she's trying to get money together so she could go over there to visit because she was thinking about perhaps moving over there because they say Gambia is such a beautiful place, which it is. The cost of living is so much cheaper than America. And plus she wanted to raise her children. She loved her children. And her second oldest daughter can recite the Quran and was doing so well. She goes to Safa Academy with Imam Kareem and uh, she's close with Imam Kareem's wife. They're teaching her Arabic and all of that. And uh, she wanted her children to be Muslim and be, stay Muslim and be raised in a, a Muslim country. So she came into our website last month and said, oh, Sister Layla, don't be af uh, afraid if because you don't hear from me for a while or see me in here. She said, I'm going to Gambia, you know, with my husband. I want to check it out. And I remember Norto asking her, you sure you want to go over there to live? And I remember uh, she said, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's all about keeping the kids, you know, Muslim because she didn't, th th her second oldest daughter, she's only 10, but she's so into the deen, you know, and the girl is smart. She's learning, memorized part of the Quran. And she was coming here to our school, Islamic school on uh, Sunday. So she left, you know, we, she went, I knew she was leaving and she's been gone now. It's, it's February month. And, but I figured she'd be back soon. And somebody came on my Facebook page uh, last week and posted that, uh, Sister Layla, I've been trying to reach you. Rashida was killed. She was murdered in Africa. I didn't believe it because there's so many scams. Uh, the person posted on there uh, that her husband uh, murdered her and took $140,000 of her money. And they said that the, uh, she, the ladies, she got it on my Facebook page. She said that uh, uh, Rashida went to visit her husband she was only there for a few days and she called home and told her oldest daughter to meet her at the airport on February 1st because she found out that the man wasn't what he said he was, that he was, uh, you know, having affairs, cheating on her, and he wasn't the scholarly man that she thought he was. And so her, uh, the, her daughter went to the airport to pick her up the next day, like she said, but she never showed up and they didn't hear from her. So they were like a week went by. And so the youngest daughter uh, texted a man and said, where's my mother? Can we speak to my mother? And he told her, he said, oh, your mother died. She died from a stroke over a week ago. 
Now, if this woman died from a stroke over a week ago, why is it no one called to tell the family until 10 days later? And her mother was in good health. And I know she was, because I remember her telling us, her and Anissa, before she left, she was sitting here talking to Anissa and, and I think me and Latif and Anissa about how she had to go through, you had, she had to prove that she had the COVID test. She had to go through a medical exam. She was, we were talking about that, how she, before she could even get her ticket, she had to pass the medical exam. She had to prove that she had the COVID shot and all of this to go. So her health was fine. She didn't have no health issues like that. So the, they knew that this was fishy because of why would my mother just have a stroke out the clear blue? Plus she was young. She was an old, an old woman. So anyway, they, her family demanded proof. So evidently the, the, the man sent pictures of her deceased to her family. And they said, looking at the pictures, they could tell that she was beaten up. You know, they were very graphic pictures and the pictures show that it wasn't no stroke. You could see that it was foul play. And also uh, she, she left with $150,000 and all that they could find was uh, uh, all of the money, all, all of the money was gone except for a thousand. So I guess the man took $140,000. I don't know, and they can't find him, but anyway, the moral is, you know, she left here, you know, thinking she had married this great man that she had met. You know, he renewed the Quran and all of this. He come out, comes out to be a fraud. And for whatever, she ended up dead in a few days, money taken. And her children, her young children, that beautiful 10-year-old daughter and her four-year-old have no mother. And we don't know, I don't know what's going to happen with them. You know, so the lesson here, the lesson here and the warning that I give to every Muslim woman and man listening to me is this. Our way of life has been perfected for us by Allah. The prophet Muhammad taught us how to find a husband. He taught us how to find a wife. He taught us what to do when we find them. Who in, he taught us how to marry. Muslims today, we're so busy imitating the Kafir, using dating apps, using social media as a means of hooking up. This is not the way to go. If a person can't find a husband or a wife in their country, what the hell makes you think that that person is a good person? If that person was all that, they wouldn't have to use a dating app to get a wife. And of a dating app, why would they look for you in the richest so-called best country in the world? America. We have to wake up as Muslim women and Muslim men because we got 50 year old uh, Muslim men doing the same thing on Clubhouse, thinking that they're going to find some righteous shaker to marry, just like the Muslim women on Clubhouse, Facebook, social media, thinking that just because a man can recite the Quran, he's a scholar. And when in reality, he's a playboy. We need to wake up Muslims. We need to come back to the Sunnah. We need to do things the way the prophet told us to do it. If you want to get a husband or a wife, you don't go to a dating app. You want a husband and a wife, you go talk to your guardians. Your guardian, if you a Muslim man, you go talk to your your family, your Muslim family. If you a Muslim woman, you talk to your Muslim family. If you a convert and you a Muslim woman, you go talk to the Imam because the Imam of your, of your community is your guardian. If you a convert Muslim man, you again go talk to the Imam of your mosque. 
And if the man of your mosque can't help you, then you go to any other mosque in your city, your state. You don't look for wives on dating apps and clubhouses. Because all you're going to find is scum. You're going to find murderers. You're going to find prostitutes and whores. You're going to find people with AIDS. You're going to find people with herpes. You're going to find people with mental problems. You're going to find people with physical disabilities. You're going to find the, 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 the scraps of society on there. You're going to find the people that can't find husbands and wives in real life because in real life, the people know that they're losers. So dating apps are filled with losers, not scholars. Righteous women are for righteous men. A righteous woman ain't going to marry no man off the clubhouse. Righteous men are for righteous women. A righteous man ain't gonna marry no woman off no dating app. Water seeks its own level. You're trash. So that's why you're using that trash media. We need to wake up. We need to bring it back to the sooner. Now here's a woman, I've only known her for a year. But all I can say is good about her. One thing I know, you look on her Facebook page, the prophet said the last deed that a person does can determine whether they end up in paradise or hell. If you look on her Facebook page, the last thing she posted was my class, the class I gave on Akita, one of my, these, this class here. And you look at everything else on her Facebook page, she has nothing on there but me and Imam Kareem. So I'm hoping that that last year of her life, this last year, that I made an impact on her as great as the impact she made on me. She stood here as I cried over my pain, her, Amina Fresno, Adisa, Antar, Onorto and him, they were here with me. My God, I'm here, Layla. Layla, they, she is really true? Yeah, she's dead. Oh my gosh. So she was beaten. Yeah. My God. So all I can oh say God. is that the impact that we made on her, mm. you know, will help her to be in a better place. Yes. I'm doing and from the that. way that they said her body looked, I can tell you one thing. You can tell she was one of Layla's Sunnah followers. Mashallah. Because she didn't go down easily. Yes. Her sister said from the photographs they had, she went out fighting. Mm. In that lie, in that so he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't take her easily. They mm. said from the bruises on her body, she went out fighting and so, kicking. And Allah. So inshallah, may she be a martyr. Amen. I'm sure. the Amen. Of Allah because he may have taken her life, but he had to walk away mm. with some, uh, some sores. Because yes. they say the thing that took her out was he hit her in the head. Yes. So he couldn't mm -hmm. he couldn't beat her physically. So mm. she was able to fight physically. Yes. But the only way the coward could take her out was by smashing her head in. Subhanallah. Did they catch him? Did they see him? No. He's gone. He's in Gambia. They were they, she was in a country. You know, so yes. my thing is you all need to be careful. You Muslim women, yes. and you know, if you guys want to get married, you turn to a law. You ask a law for help. You, you don't use Clubhouse. You don't use a Facebook. You don't use dating apps to look for no husband. You go to your guardian, and then you remain patient. 
and make doer all these classes I've taught you guys how to pray, how to get your doers answer. You supplicate between the Adon and the Ekamet. You get up in the middle of the night and supplicate. You remain patient with the Carter of Allah until he sends you that righteous man, but you don't ever go out thinking you're going to find him on your own, on social media, because there's nothing there but trash. And you men, you should know better too. You want a righteous wife? You pray to Allah for one and you go to the mosque and get familiar with the imam so the imam can look out for his, the who's in his community that is available. Get off the club. Get off of social media. Ain't no scholars in those places. And don't be stupid. Don't y'all know shaitan knows the Quran too? How did we learn about Ayat Korsi? Shaitan can probably recite the Quran better than any of us. But he's still shaitan. Just because a person comes swinging their arms and reciting the Quran don't make them nobody except a singer. Because if you were intelligent, you would know to ask him, can you tell me what that means? They can't explain it. Stop being stupid and duped. Does everybody understand me? And teach your children to stay off of social media. Teach your children you're not going to find nothing good there. Not for no marriage. And watch what your children are doing. Watch who they're hanging out with. You husbands, watch your wives. Make sure that your wives are not wasting their time on the clubhouse or on social media while you working. Make, give your wife work to do around the house. Have your wife memorize verses of the Quran. Have your wife join my classes to see if she can pass my quizzes. Because while you work and your wife is sitting up in the club or on Facebook with a bunch of men, which is haram in Islam anyway. You got, we got to check ourselves and get back to the sooner. I can just imagine the last moments of her life when she realized what the mistake was, when she made that call to her ch children, her oldest daughter saying, boy, what a mistake I made. I can imagine how she felt. And I can see her packing her stuff to come home. And I can see this piece of trash uh, telling her she ain't going nowhere. And I can see him grabbing her. And I can see her fighting, kicking his ugly butt. And I can see him picking up something, busting her head open like he did, which is what killed her. Let's not let it be you. So is her body going to be left in Africa? I don't know. That type of stuff. I mean, she, like I say, she's part of Imam Kareem's community. I'm sure, you know, if they, her fam, he could, they got the money where they could do something. I don't know. You know, like I said, I just found out about this stuff and um, that her person that messaged me, I don't do GoFundMes. And I told that person, you don't need to do a GoFundMe because her community, she comes from a community that is not poor. And her imam has, I'm pretty sure, has a zakat fund. So if they wanted her body back here, I'm sure that he, you know, would give them the money where they could get it back. You know, without having to beg people. Because I know she wouldn't like that. She wouldn't want nobody begging because she learned here that begging is haram. And she wasn't trailer park trash. She was a professional woman. She had two professional jobs. She wasn't a welfare recipient, and I know she wouldn't want no GoFundMe because that she wouldn't want that. And working for the government, I'm pretty sure she has a life insurance policy. You know? So just beware, guys. Beware of social media as far as dating and picking up husbands and wives. Any of you that's stupid to do that, you're just stupid. All right. Let me go ahead and start the class now. Uh, we've been speaking about how um, 
how to perform the prayer correctly from A to Z, the way the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to perform it. And uh, one of the uh, things we talked about is how so many Muslims out there argue the religion and debate about whether or not you should recite the Fatiha behind the Imam. And we talked about how this is something that, why would people argue? Because the prophet already answered that question. So who can tell us when you're praying with the Imam, should you recite that Fatiha with him or after him? Who can answer that and give us the evidence? Anyone? You're at the mosque praying. The Imam is reciting the Fatiha. Should you recite with him or after him? Um, if the Imam is reciting it, then he's reciting it for everybody. Okay, did you guys hear it? What she said, anybody uh, agree with what she said or want to add to it or she leave out something? Yeah, I agree with what she said. You have a choice. If you want to recite it to yourself, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. You have to. a choice? Y'all you agree? She, she didn't say you had a choice. Oh, no, I no, no, you don't have a choice. If the Iman is reciting it, then he's reciting it for everybody. And if he's not reciting it, you can recite it yourself silently. Okay, you agree with her answer or you yeah. agree with Precious? Precious said you got a choice. Who's right, guys? Okay, the correct answer is you don't have a choice. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when the Imam is reciting the Quran, you shut up and listen. You ponder. When the Imam is reciting, you don't recite, you listen. So that's no choice. But in the silent prayers, like say, for example, the imam is leading you in my grip. The first rock cut and the second rock cut, he recites out loud. You don't have to recite because his recitation is yours. And also the prophet said, when the imam recites, you remain silent. But what about the third rock cut? What about the third rock cut? The third rock cut you do recite because why? Who can tell us why? Why is it that I would recite in the third rock out of my grip? Because the imam um, will recite it silently. Yes, and in in every in every rock that you have, you have to recite al fatiha. Exactly, because there are no prayers accepted without al fatiha. You have to recite the al fatiha in every rock out. And since the imam is not reciting out loud in the third rakat, then you have to recite for yourself. Everybody understand? So you don't have a choice. When you hear people reciting after the imam, they are disobeying the prophet because the prophet said when the imam is reciting, you remain quiet. One time the prophet was leading the people in prayer and somebody was reciting with him. He stopped and said, when the imam recites, you remain silent. Everybody understand that? So when people tell you that you recite with him, where's their evidence? Where's the evidence? They have no evidence. The evidence is you remain silent, but in the silent rakats, you recite. Everybody understand? Any yeah. questions about that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so he's recitation. But I meant when you're silent, when he's silent, then you recite to yourself. That's what I meant, but I didn't <laughs> word it correctly. Yeah. Okay. What did you say, Fredo? His recitation, his silent recitation, is not your recitation. Recite means to say something out loud. If he's reciting silently, you don't hear nothing anyway, right? But if he is for you, no? He ain't out loud. If he's out loud, yeah. Recite means to speak out loud, guys. You okay? So if the imam is speaking out loud, you shut up and listen. If he ain't speaking, 
then you recite for yourself. Everybody understand that? Recite means to read out loud. Everybody understand? Because I can be sitting here picking at my nose. I ain't saying nothing. You have to recite Fatiha in every rakat. If the imam is reciting the Fatiha out loud, you get the reward of his recitation. When the imam is silent, you have to say your own Fatiha. Everybody understand? Just like the sutra, you get the, if the imam has a sutra, his sutra is yours. If the imam ain't got no sutra, then you don't have one. You guys understand? Is that clear? What about Facebook? Let me see. Okay, it's clear. So so what about all the times that I didn't say nothing and he was giving his silent? That means that it wasn't accepted from me or from this point on now that I know. Okay, does the law punish us for what we didn't know? No. Okay, remember, what did the prophet say about the mistakes? The mistakes, the minor sins, the minor sins are the things that we did or didn't do that we did not know we shouldn't do. Y'all understand? And we are forgiven for the minor sins every time we make wudu and every Friday and all of that. So the mistakes we make, Allah forgives us for because you didn't know, but now you know you have to recite the Fatiha when you're praying with your husband and your husband is reciting out loud, you don't have to recite with him. But on the silent part of the prayer, that's when you recite. Just like when you prostrate. Do y'all think that y'all don't say anything when you prostrate? You don't get the reward of the imam supplication. You that, When you prostrate, you say, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Yeah, so you say everything in the rakats, but as far as reciting the Fatiha, you don't have to recite it out loud behind him. Everybody understand that? When what he, if he finishes and yeah. says Allahu Akbar before you finish saying it? It's okay. Allah still rewards you for your... Why would Allah reward you guys? For the Maybe, intention. There, there you go. Because Allah knows that you're, you intended to finish it. Does everybody understand? Yes. yes. Dr. Yes. Saeed taught that the other day. You know, if you're praying and you don't get a chance to finish your Fatiha, you get the reward of your intentions. Because Allah knows it was your intention to finish it, so it's as if you finished it. Okay, any other questions on that? Yeah, yes, I have okay. a question. I have yeah, a question ahead. on, is somebody else saying something? I have no. a question on, okay, remember you said we make our duas and, and sajda, right? Yeah, now, if somebody can. is leading us and they saying a law about coming back up, how do you how do you get a chance to finish your duas if you're okay. praying with someone else? But then don't worry about it. When you make your sunnah prayers, you make your supplicate. That's why we talked about the sunnahs. Oh, Remember, okay. you know, that's the purpose of, that's another one of the reasons why people make sunnah rakats. Because in the, the obligatory rakat, if I'm praying at the mosque with the imam, I don't have a chance to do my personal dua. But I'm going to now do the two rakats of my grip that gives me a chance to do my personal supplications. Everybody understand? Also, that's why we do the night prayers. Yes. I didn't have a chance to make my personal supplications because I prayed at the mosque with the imam. But now I'm at home, I can make my personal supplications. So that's another uh, one of the reasons uh, why we make the voluntary prayers. Okay. Hey, look, can I share this with some of the married people on the website? If you want. I have, I have a close friend. She will not pray with her husband because she can't make her personal doors. And there's nothing I can do to help her. I just wanted to share that, y'all. Please don't do that. Married people. Please don't be ignorant like that. It's a panel law. Y'all hear me? Later, they hear me? Yeah, yes, I, I, hear I, heard, yeah. I heard. I heard. I'm, I'm doing law.
Okay, so again, guys, I want y'all to remember that I'm looking at the questions I'm getting. That's why I'm pausing. People texting me. Wait a minute. Uh, look on the Facebook. Yeah, so that's what that is. What about this, guys? Um, what's the other thing they argued about? <sighs> Reciting the Fatiha uh, with uh, the Imam. What about this? Who can remember? Do we have to recite the opening, an opening supplication before the Fatiha? No, we do not. Yeah, we don't have to. We don't have to recite an, an opening supplication uh, 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 before the Fatiha. What about this? Is uh, Bismillah part of the Fatiha? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. What about this? Uh, do we have to say Amin? No. 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 Amin part of the Fatiha? No, it's not. No, no it's not. Good job. Good answers. Very good. Uh, let's see. Um, well, let me see. I'm looking at other questions here. Okay. okay, any other questions from anybody in here on that, on the Zoom room? Mm -hmm. Hold on, let me send this text to this person. I just had to text that person his answer. Okay, I gave you your answer, brother. Check your text. Okay, let me go back. Since he can't hear, this brother can't hear for some reason. So, okay, any other questions? And try to restart. Oh, he can't hear me. <laughs> type to him to restart his computer because I can't type my arthritis. Okay, so those are just some of the things we talked about. Um, and yesterday we spoke about the things that are disliked about the prayer, things that uh, we shouldn't do, but do these things break the prayer? No. Let's put the quiz up here on the screen, inshallah. Things that we should not do. And by the way, guys, uh, a couple of people ask me, why don't I post that guy's picture? No, I'm not, because no Muslim woman on this planet should be on a date nap. It's un-Islamic. Dating apps contradict Islam. So why post a picture? If you on a date nap, you committing a sin anyway, to be honest. You ain't doing things the way the prophet said. Do y'all understand? It's all about practicing Islam correctly. If you are a righteous Muslim woman, you would never use a dating app to find a husband. You would go to your guardian the way Allah commanded you. The only people who do that are you sisters who sin. I just got, I'm just gonna tell the truth. You women and men, cause it's a bunch of you crazy men too. 50 year old men. You women and men who use so social media and dating apps, you are sinning. You're the ones that end up in this situation. So why should I not post nobody's picture? Because people with sense ain't gonna end up in there anyway. Only you losers, I hate to say it, only you losers end up in there. We're sooner followers. We're following the Sunnah. 
And in this case, the sister had already married him. She married him before she started coming to my website. Y'all understand? When she came here, wasn't she already married to him? Y'all, yeah, because she was talking about him. Yeah, she was married to him. Yes. They had been married for a couple of years, wasn't she, Awa? I thought this is what she was telling us. Yes. Yeah, yeah, she was married to him, but when she started coming here, she's only been here a year. Had she known me before then, she probably would never have married him. Because had she known me before then, she wouldn't have been using uh, social media to find a man. So she was married to him when she came here. She'd already made that mistake, but this was the first time she went to see him, you know, so I couldn't stop her. But then it was too late. The damage was done. This idiot was plotting and planning what to do to her probably all this time. But for the rest of y'all listening to me, if you're that stupid to use dating apps, then you deserve whatever you get because you're stupid. So don't use them. All right, you ain't gonna find nothing good on them things. Okay, let me put the um uh, power, the, the quiz up for the, today. I'm so messed up behind. And you guys have to excuse me. I'm just so outdone because I had really gotten close with her. I mean, all of us did here. Like I said, she's in our, you listen to our Hadith class and she's in there giving her little uh, answers, her comments with Norto in them. So it's just, just gonna be weird. Okay. All right. The brother texts me again. He can't hear. I can't, I'm not texting him back. Okay. Let's look at the first question here. Question number one, true or false? Moving around during the prayer breaks the prayer and to move more than three times requires the prayer to be reperformed. Is that statement true or false? Moving around during the prayer will break your prayer. And if you move more than three times, you have to make the prayer over. What do y'all think? Is that true or false? This is false. You don't have to uh, uh, re-perform re the prayer again. As long as uh, you're still facing the Qibla, you're good. Y'all agree with her answer? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, alhamdulillah, this is correct. And walaikum salam, Sister Zaria. How's your sister doing? Mashallah, I haven't seen you and your sister in a long time. Mashallah, Zaria, you and um, give my salams to your family. Alhamdulillah. Exactly. So this is false, guys. Moving around during the prayer does not break your prayer. And when you hear Muslims say, uh, if you move three times, you have to remake it, that's a mathab thought. That's a, so one of those mathabs, but that's not anything from the Sunnah. There's nothing from the Sunnah that says that you can only move three times, okay? But this is what one of the mathabs teaches. But we don't follow mathabs. We follow the, uh, my thumb. We follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we want to try to move as little as possible because the movement can distract you, okay? But it doesn't break your prayer as some people uh, think, okay? All right, let's look at the next question. Question number two, placing the hands on the hips when praying is allowed, true or false? To place um, your hands on your hips while they well, like come slime, baby. Um, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, it "Is haram to put one's hand on one's hip during salat because this means it is a sign of arrogance, and the jinns and shaitans put their hands on their hips." Exactly. He gave the evidence and he explained it, spoken from one of my babes here. He's from Africa. Hello, the good of the African soil. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> exactly. 
You know, we don't put our hands on our mm -hmm. hips because this is what the jinn do, as he said. It's also a sign of arrogance. So when you stand before your Lord, you want to stand in humility. You know, you don't put your hands. In fact, you shouldn't do that in real life at all. Break your daughters out of that. Because that's, I mean, my granddaughter, Jayla, was, huh, uh, no, you're going to take them hands off that hip before I break them off. You know, that's what the gin do. The gin put their hands on their hips and do the honey child. We don't do that as Muslims. Okay. All right. Question number three. What does Islam say about looking up at the sky when you pray? What does Islam say about looking up at the sky when you pray? It says the prophet. We said that we shouldn't. Oh, go ahead, baby. At, at the baby. The prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Those who look up in the sky should stop, or Allah may take your eyesight away." And that is what the Christians and Jews do. So we need to be different from those that do not follow Allah. Exactly. He gave the complete evidence and explained it. That's what I'm saying. If this child can explain it so perfectly why do you all adults have a hard time explaining your answers y'all just give me one word sentences he gives you the whole sentence come on people exactly you know islam teaches us that we don't look up at the sky that's what the christians do we're supposed to be the opposite of them the prophet said anyone that looks up at the sky allah will take away your eyesight maybe that's why we can't see we too busy looking up at the sky imitating the christians Okay, so no looking up at the sky when you're praying. What about when I'm making dua, when I'm supplicating? Can I look up at the sky when I'm supplicating? No. no. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Not even then. Everybody understand that? Mashallah, good job. Okay, let's look at the next question. Question number four. Aisha tells us that the prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed in a cloak that had designs on it. And he said, these designs have distracted me. So he took the cloak off and said, give it to Abu Jaham and tell him to replace it with a plain cloak. This hadith proves that wearing clothes with designs on them while praying is forbidden. Is that statement true or false? This is how we learn to understand the meaning of the hadiths. True or false? What do y'all think? That hadith uh, illustrates that praying with clothes and that have designs on them is forbidden. True or false? What do y'all think? False. That's false. false. That's false. Anybody think it's true? Does anybody think it's true? What about Facebook? Aisha tells us that the prophet prayed in a cloak that had designs on it. He took it off and said, these designs have distracted me. So take this cloak to Abu Jaham and tell him to give me a plain one. Wearing clothes with designs while praying is forbidden based on that hadith. Is that true or false? False. False. Nobody it's think it's true? It's not forbidden. Okay, nobody think it's true? I'm looking at y'all on Facebook too. Okay, this is false, but this is an example as to how you have to learn from the people of knowledge. Because if I had not taught you guys this yesterday, you would have read this hadith and you would have thought it's haram. That's why we go to some of these masjids like the imams here were telling me on Facebook. They argue over this. A brother will come to the mosque with a, a shirt on that has um, uh, uh, designs on it. And somebody will say, oh, he can't pray in that shirt. How many of you have experienced that? The imams here said that it happens all the time. And then when you say, what you mean? They give this hadith. And that hadith does appear like, well, the prophet took it off and said, I'm distracted. Give me a plain one. If you didn't know any better, you would think that means you have to wear a plain one. I remember one time, even myself, I was living in Southern Ohio. I came up here to visit with my family and we were praying and my brother Issa, y'all know my brother Issa, Mr. Saudi. 
My brother Issa came to me after we finished praying. He grabbed my garment and said, you can't pray. And that, it's got designs on it. You pray, your prayer is not accepted. I said, what? You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed in a cloak that had designs on it. He took it off and gave it away. He said, because we're distracting. So what you doing? I said, Isa, that hadith does not mean it's forbidden to pray in designs. The prophet was distracted by those designs. He did not say nobody else could pray in it. It distracted him. And I remember I had to, we went back and forth and he didn't understand. So I told him, I'll tell you what, call Sheikh Morsi. <laughs> and he called Sheikh Morsi. I said, call Sheikh Morsi. I said, ask Sheikh Morsi to explain it to you. And I walked away and, I, and then Sheikh Morsi explained it to him. So a lot of people will read that hadith and think that, but it doesn't mean that. It's just that that distracted the prophet. What may be distracting to you may not be distracting for me. Right. Everybody understand that? Just like beauty. Beauty lies in the eye of the beholder. What's beautiful to you may be ugly to me. Okay? Well, the same with that. You know, what? The, I worked for 36 years in an institution where clients screamed, hollered all night long. After 36 years, it desensitizes you. Noise doesn't bother me. I can make salat with no problem. I can pray with the TV on and I don't hear the TV. I can pray with the radio blasting because for 36 years, I had to pray Fodger with radios blasting. Mm -hmm. So I become desensitized. I can tune out noise. When I lived at my other apartment, the neighbors ran around upstairs over me. I never complained. A lot of people say, oh my God, you know, you never complain about your neighbors. I say, I'm gonna be honest. I tune them out. I don't hear them. But whenever my Jayla would, when Jayla moved in with me, she's like, mom, I can't sleep. Those kids upstairs. How do you live this way? I said, I don't hear it. I'm desensitized. So we're all different. You know, what bothers you may not bother me. What appeals to you may not appeal to me. What distracts you may not distract me. And so that's why the prophet did not say that it's haram to pray with designs. In fact, you will find many hadiths that show that the companions prayed with designs and on their garments. So we have to be careful. This is why the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, learn from the people of knowledge. You cannot teach yourself Islam. You will read a hadith like that and totally misconstrue the meaning. You have to sit with the people of knowledge and learn from them. Everybody understand that. And so that's the hadith that uh, uh, the brothers that we have with us here on Facebook who are in training to be imams, they say the people use that, but that is not what it means, okay? What about this one? Aisha, she had a curtain to cover the doorway of her home. One day the prophet came home and said, remove that curtain because it's pictures distract me during my prayers. So based on this hadith, praying where there are pictures of things is forbidden based on this. Is that true or false? This is false. Why is it false? The, the prophet would have said, um, having pictures up while praying is not allowed he only said it was it distracted him exactly exactly he didn't tell her to burn the curtain he didn't tell her a stock for law we cannot pray in a room that has a picture of a bird or a picture by the way guys you guys know i got pictures of lions and tigers in my bedroom i pray in my bedroom every all my prayers because i want as many rewards as i can get and you guys know when I take my cameras off, my whole bedroom is lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. 
You guys see my bear. I got lions and tigers and bears everywhere. Look at that. Look at my curtains, tigers, lions, bears. Oh my. And look at the three big fat cats on my bed. I got lions and tigers everywhere. Can't no man come in this house. He gonna be attacked. And they don't distract me. They don't distract me. You know, but now somebody else may come to my house and be distracted. Somebody else, my brother Issa might come here and say, uh, Layla, I want to pray in your room, but uh, I'm distracted by them, them tigers. They getting ready to jump out and eat me. So Issa might take the curtains down and knowing him, he's so fanatical, he will. He'll take the curtains down. No, he wouldn't pray in my room. He'd go pray somewhere else. So everybody is different, guys. You know, and by the way, that hadith proves something else too. Because she took the curtains down and made cushions out of them. What else does that hadith prove that we talked about when we did the law for the unlawful? Who can tell us? It proves as long as you are sitting or walking on an image like that, you're defacing it, so it's okay. Exactly. That's also the hadith that proves that there is nothing wrong with having curtains and bedspreads with, with animals on them or even people because the prophet said it's defacing it. If you sit on it, eat on it, sleep on it, it's being defaced. And as long as the picture is on cloth. So that's also the dalio that I can have uh, pictures of a lion and tiger in my curtains and on my bed, but not hanging up on my walls. Because when I put it in a frame on my wall, it's not the same as being on cloth that I'm sitting on, sleeping on, you know, hitting all the time and all that. Everybody understand? You understand, Rashida? So it's different. We talk about the angels. The angels do not enter a home that has pictures of people and animals on display. That doesn't mean cloth. The prophet said you take a picture of your baby and put it on your mantle. Uh, or I take a picture of my cat and put it on mantle. He's not talking about a picture of a tiger on a piece of cloth that you lay on. Y'all see the difference? Everybody understand that? So that's the hadith that proves that too. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked by uh, the companions, oh Prophet, I have pictures of birds and I have pictures of elephants on my shirt. Can I wear this shirt? The Prophet said, as long as the pictures are on cloth, as long as you are wearing it, yes. But you cannot take a picture of anything with a soul and make a statue out of it or put it on display. You understand, Rashida? My pictures of my tigers and lions, they, first of all, they ain't real. <laughs> first of all, they're not real, um, but they're not on display. Y'all see that? They're just, they're defaced, even the cats. My stupid cats think it's part of their pack. My cats think they're real. They see how they all in their pack together. All three of them laying up there with those lions thinking that they in a real pack. And y'all should see me when I go to take them bed spreads off. If I was to remove them bed spreads, them cats would jump up and they're trying to fight me thinking I'm taking their pack away. <laughs> they think it's real, but it's not. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Layla, I have a question as far as in the images. Um, yes, this, would, it be the same, would it be the same as a design, um, like a picture on your shirt when, you, when you're saying your prayers? Would that be still considered Yeah, the same design? thing. This was a okay. companion played in the pr pray. He prayed in pictures. He said, okay. oh, prophet of Allah, I have a picture on my shirt. Can I pray in it? The prophet said, as long as it's on cloth, yes, because it's being defaced. It's okay. defaced. You're not worshiping it. Okay, it's defaced. You know, to worship, if I take something and put it on the, on the wall and don't touch my pick, that's worship. But if I'm eating on it, sleeping on it, 
urinating on it, defecating on it, whatever and on it, then that's not worship. That's why said, that shows the hikmah of Islam. That shows the hikmah of Allah. Allah knows what worship is. If you're defacing it, you're not worshiping it. Everybody understand? The same with rugs. Some of the companions had rugs. They remember guys, the companions did a lot of trading. They did a lot of trading with Persia, with China and other parts of the world. And these people were into uh, beautiful tapestries with pictures of animals on it. Pictures of birds on the Chinese were the ones with the silk and the birds. And so we have a lot of hadiths where the companion said, oh, prophet of Allah, I have a rug that has a picture of an elephant. This one, he got it from Persia. The, he said, can I have that pick that rug in my home? The prophet said, yes, as long as it's on cloth, because you walk on it, you deface it. This is not worship. Does everybody understand? You walk on it. This is not worship. Okay. All right. So let's look at the next question here. Let me, who is that? Sabrine. Let me mute you, Sabrine, because you be moaning and groaning and coughing and yakking and <laughs> need to hear that on the video. Okay. Let's look at the next question. What does Islam say about closing your eyes during the prayer? And this is something that a lot of people ask me. Sister Layla, can I close um, your it, eyes? Go ahead. It's a, um, Ibn al Qayyim said the correct position if keeping one's eyes open does not affect one's attention, then it is preferred to keep them open. However, if there is something in front of the person such as some ornament toy decoration that could affect him in um the, yeah that it is no way dislike to close his eyes exactly so they, so they should close their eyes yeah so yeah if there's something in front of you that may distract you mm -hmm. like say for example i'm praying and say I, I get distracted by that tiger in my curtain. Then I can close my eyes. Y'all understand? To not because, you know, but we should try to keep our eyes open when we pray. Because again, the prophet wanted us to be different, to be different from the Christians and Jews. And your eyes should remain focused on the spot on the floor where you prostrate. But say, for example, if it helps you to concentrate to close your eyes or say I am praying and I see that my waterfall in front of me is distracting me, I can close my eyes to focus. Does everybody understand? See how simple and easy Islam is. You know, we make the prayer harder than what it is. We make the religion ugly by saying everything is haram when it's not. Most things in life are lawful, guys. Okay, let's look at the last question. What about this? The food, if the food is ready or you have to answer the call of nature, should you pray first or not and explain why? If the food is ready or you have to answer the call of nature, should you pray first or not and why? You should um, pray. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead baby. baby. Go ahead. Um, you should pray first. Be, I mean, no, you should not pray first. You should, say you're fasting and you, and it's time for mukra, and you have not eaten. You should eat first, or at least one day, and drink some milk, and then pray because the Shias they. They f wait until it's ish just and then it's, and you that you don't want to follow the Shias because we are following the prophet. That's what the prophet has done. And you should not w hold your pee or w urinate because you, you could pee on yourself accidentally. So you should just and the, if you get a new wudu because what's the problem of getting a new wudu? Exactly. Mashallah. You guys see how he answered that. 
Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> he can answer these questions better than you adults. Exactly, guys. May Allah He's bless him. him. Yeah. I'm trying to keep up with him. I'm trying to keep up with you, little brother. Yeah, and make sure you're here for Dr. Saeed's uh, Tajweed class too, brother Abdul Najib. That's on Fridays, and make sure you're here for his uh, Hadith class on Sundays, Riyadh Salahin, and his other class on Saturdays, 11.30. Inshallah. I'm so proud of you and your parents. Alhamdulillah. But yes, guys, he answered that. You know, you want to go ahead and, and eat first. Uh, go ahead and urinate first, so that way you're not distracted. You know, it's all about keeping that kushua, the kushua during the prayer. You don't want to lose your concentration, your focus. And we're going to talk about Kushua starting uh, tomorrow, inshallah, because a lot of you have asked me, what are some things you can do to help strengthen your Kushua during the prayer? So we're going to talk about that because uh, 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 starting tomorrow, things that can help with your Kushua. Okay. And these are two things that the prophet taught us. If the food is ready, eat first. That way you're not praying thinking, oh man, I got to hurry up. If you got to use the bathroom, use the bathroom first. So that way you're not praying thinking, oh, I got to hold it or any of that. Good job, Sister Malika too. Good job, Sister Zarina. Uh, Sister Zarina gave us a good answer. Uh, uh, Zarina, one of your answers I wanted to read. Uh, where's her answer? She said here, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a human being and had preferences and dislikes. For example, he didn't prefer to eat lizard, but he did not command us to not eat lizard. Okay, again, if something is haram, like she's saying, he would say it's haram. Okay, if it doesn't say it's haram, it's not haram, and we can't make it haram. You know, because what's good for you may not be uh, good for me. Let's see what else we have here. Are cloth or rugs hung flat on the walls? Yes, those are curtains. Yes, that is a curtain. That's, that's being on a piece of cloth. Remember, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said if it's on a piece of cloth. Okay, all right. Okay, mashallah, any questions about any of those answers? You guys did so well. Any questions about any of those answers? Everybody's good with that? Mashallah. Okay, now, today what we're going to do, let me put the uh, PowerPoint up here so you guys can see it. And like I said, tomorrow, I'm going to begin my series on kushua, you know, how to strengthen, because a lot of the brothers here, uh, the imams in training, uh, they said that uh, that's one of the questions they have, how to focus your kushua, I mean, uh, strengthen it. We'll talk about that starting tomorrow. But for today, we talked about the things that do not break the prayer. We talked about the things that Allah uh, doesn't like for us to do. Today, I'm going to speak about the things that we should not do because they will invalidate the prayer. Okay? And let's start with right here. What about this? Eating or drinking while praying. Believe it or not, guys, there are some Muslims out there who are crazy enough to do this. They can be standing up in the Allahu Akbar eating a, a falafel. Listen to what Ibn al Munzer says. He said, the people of knowledge agree that if a person intentionally eats or drinks during a far prayer, he is to repeat the prayer. The same is the case with voluntary, according to the majority of scholars as what invalidates the obligatory prayer also invalidates, invalidates the voluntary prayer. So if you're deliberately, intentionally doing like this man, a law walk bar, and you're gonna eat something, you, you got to, man, this is not how we pray. Remember, you have to imagine that you are standing before a law, that you're standing before a law, and you have to stand in humility. 
Would you want to stand there with a falafel in your hand or something? Come on, guys, a shmarm in your hand? No. So eating or drinking while praying, that would break it. Now, what about this? What do y'all think about chewing gum? No, that doesn't. Say, for example, I got gum in my mouth and I, you know, a lot of people chew gum and are not even aware they got it in the mouth. That's different. I'm, and I'm not even chewing it. It's just in my mouth. Okay, that doesn't break. But to deliberately, intentionally eat and drink like this, you can forget your prayer. But if you had gum in your mouth and forgot it's in there or say it's just in there, but you ain't chewing it, it's just there. That's something different. Everybody understand. Okay. Also this. What about this? Speaking intentionally about something unrelated to the prayer. You know, we see this in the masjid. Dr. Jamali talked about this. You go to the mosque. You see people, you lead in the prayer. You see people talking on they, the phone ring. They take their phone. Hello. Or they do the Fresno answer. Can you imagine that at Fresno? You praying. You got a head, they got a headset on like you. Allahu Akbar, answer. This is not what we do, guys. To speak intentionally on your cell phone and things like that when you pray, and this invalidates the prayer. Listen to what Zaid Ibn Arkham said. He said, We used to talk while we were in prayer and a person would speak to the person next to him until Allah sent down the verse where he says in the interpretation of the meaning, stand before Allah in obedience. And after that, we were commanded to observe silence during the prayer. So there's the Dalil. There's the authentic Hadith, the Dalil. So ain't no cell phone talking or unnecessary talking during the prayer. Also, Ibn Masu. Ibn Masu says, we used to greet the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, while he was in prayer. And he used to respond. Then one time we returned from Ethiopia. We greeted him, but he did not respond. So we asked him, O oh, prophet of Allah, we used to greet you while you were praying and you would answer. He said, prayer demands a person's complete attention. How are you giving your attention to a law if you're sitting there on your cell phone talking to somebody or you sitting there trying to talk to the person across from you? We have to be careful of these things, guys. We have to be careful of this stuff. This stuff is, is, is not right, okay? And unfortunately, many Muslims are doing these things. Now, talking, if it is a reminder, does not break the prayer. Like we talked about, um, uh, uh, so if you say, like the imam makes a, a, a mistake, and you say, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, to get his attention, that doesn't break the prayer. And also this hadith here, Abu Huraira says the prophet, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led us either in the noon or the afternoon prayer. And he made the taslim after praying just two rakats. Dul Yadin said to the prophet, O prophet of Allah, has the prayer been shortened or did you forget some of it? The prophet said, no, it has not been shortened. Did I forget? And he said, yes, O messenger of Allah, you did. So the prophet asked the people, is Dul Yadin correct? The people said, yes, you only did two rakats. So then the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, prayed the two remaining rakat and made the taslim, said the takbir and performed the sajda and et cetera. So here you can see, if you are talking to remind somebody that the prayer, you know, they made a mistake or something like that, that doesn't invalidate. But to just talk frivolously on the phone about nothing, that's something different. And we talked about movements. We talked about how moving doesn't break the prayer. But if a person intentionally, and this is what Brother Haytham was talking about yesterday. If a person intentionally makes a lot of movements, 
it can break your prayer. Everybody understand that? So again, we try our best to remain still. But if you want to turn around and intentionally you looking all around to see who's coming in the door, you looking all around to see this and that, then that may break your prayer. Does everybody understand that? We talked about how you can pick up your children. That doesn't break the prayer. But a person that's constantly moving and looking around, being nosy, this is a person that's not focused. This is a person that has no kushua, you know, and that his, his prayer may be broken. Also, Imam Anawawi tells us that the scholars are in agreement that many actions invalidate the prayer if they are performed consecutively. In other words, one after the other. If a person separates the actions, for instance, taking a step and then stopping, then taking another step, then taking two more, then taking more, you know, this is different, okay? So again, guys, we have to remember that the whole purpose of praying is to show humility before your Lord. And that's where the Sunnah actions come in. We talked about how the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, when a person raises the hands and says, says Sami Allah, huli min hamida, rabbina wa lakul hum, this pushes the shaitan back. We talked about how the prophet said when the person is sitting in Jalsa and raises the finger up and down, the finger becomes an iron bar to keep your jinn away. And we're going to talk more about that. Those sunnah actions of the prayer, they help to keep you focused, to keep your kushua in place. Does everybody understand that? Okay, that'll help you uh, to pre prevent yourself from moving too much. Also, another thing that can invalidate the prayer is to intentionally leave out a pillar or condition without any valid excuse. We have from Bukhari and Muslim that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told a Bedouin who had not performed his prayer well to go back and pray it. And Brother Haytham spoke about this hadith yesterday how a man came in the mosque and he rushed and rushed, did his prayer so fast. The prophet said, ain't no way that you had humility with Allah. Go back and make it over. Ibn Rushud, he says, there is no, he said, there is an agreement that if a person prays and he is not in a state of purity, then it becomes obligatory for him to repeat the prayer. So say, for example, uh, you pass gas or something like that, or like the little brother was saying, you urinate on yourself, you know, you have to repeat that. Also, a person who prays without facing the Kibla intentionally, you intentionally don't face the Kibla. You know, so when these pillars are broken, an essential pillar is left out you know, then you're going to have to repeat that prayer. Y'all know that. If you don't recite Al-Fatiha in none of the Rakats, you have to make that over because there is no prayer without Al-Fatiha. And that brings us to the big question here. What about laughing? Laughing uncontrollably. If you laugh uncontrollably, it will break the prayer. Okay, but if you laugh, you know, and it's not uncontrollable, then that's different. So it depends, and the scholars and the companions said this too, because we have hadiths where uh, people, uh, some of the companions uh, talked about laughing during a prayer. You know, if a person just, <clears throat> you know, it catches himself, you know, that's different, but to just, ha, 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 just to break out laughing and woo hoo hoo and all of that. <laughs> you got to make it over. And sometimes it happens, guys. You know, I can tell you one time I was praying by myself. 
This is when I first, uh, right before I had my knee surgery, I was standing up, praying by myself, me and my cats, you know, Karen and them sitting there with me. I think I told y'all about it. And I happened to tip over. I fell down and I'm sorry. I laughed so bad at myself. I had to make my prayer over. I just laughed at myself because I thought I was ridiculous falling like that. You know, I, and I made that over. I said, boy, you can't do that later. So if, it depends on how severe of a laughter it is, you know, but if it's just a little, <clears throat> you catch it and stop it. Some of the scholars say you are good to go, but if it's an uncontrollable laughter, they say you have to then make it over. Okay, so these are just some of the things that will invalidate the prayer. You don't want to intentionally be looking all around and dodging and, oh, who's that coming in the door? You know, that's going to break your prayer. And talking. You on your cell phone. Hey, what's up? Let me call you back. We making salat. How you doing anyway? How's the kids? You, your prayer is broken. Okay, any questions? Oh, and look, Dr. Saeed's here. Mashallah. Salam alaikum, Dr. Saeed. How are you? Dr. Saeed, alhamdulillah, he's here, guys. There he is. I'm glad you hear here, Dr. Saeed. Alaykum so salam wa rahmatullahi wa Sister Layla, how are you doing? Okay, because they always have questions about this. Since Dr. Saeed is here, guys, go. here we go. They got questions already. Here's one for you, Dr. Saeed. Sister so, Zarina wants to know, she said, if a person snaps their fingers, yeah. or claps their hands at a, one of the children that's being bad, will that break the prayer? Like say you're praying and your child does something so you to try to get them to stop, does that break the prayer? She clapped to her children or what? Yeah, she was um, making salad and the children say they come in the room acting bad so she does yes. like this yes. and let them know. Clab clabbing by her hand, no problem. Atash, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, called clubbing for uh, women. Okay. And tasbih for, and tasbih for men. If you have a problem in prayer, uh, your imam forget something, you can, uh, you can uh, make, take your, in, your attention by say subhanallah for men. Women can do that. She can say, uh, she can clapping by her hand, by hand. Alhamdulillah. You got your answers, Arena? Yeah, so there's, she said, what about snapping the fingers? Like say you, I can't do it. You snap your finger to get them to stop too. She yes, said, she yes, no, pro no problem. Okay, yeah, so it's okay, Zarina. He said you can do both. Yeah, any other questions? Zoom people, go ahead. We have Dr. Saeed here, Alhamdulillah. Sabrine, I'm sorry. Let me unmute you. Go ahead, Sabrine. Any questions? Did I unmute her? Yeah. Brothers, okay, I'm let me read this. Sorry, I got three people, three computers going. 